everyone hits a bump in the road. What do you do with it? Be inspired as we explore the ways people experience, navigate, and manage the ups and downs and twists and turns in this road trip called life. Welcome to another episode of Bump in the Road. The basic podcast is always free. We also have a premium subscription called Bump 2 that lets you listen in on extended behind-the-scenes conversations with our guests. Check it out at www.bumpintheroad.us. For 22 years, Mary Beth Collins has been living with cancer. Not hers, but her son's. At just two years old, her son Josh was diagnosed with neuroblastoma. After chemo and a risky bone marrow transplant, the cancer was NED, no evidence of disease. But Josh's medical odyssey and that of his mother had just begun. Mary Beth, welcome to Bump in the Road. If you would, give us a little background on your story. Well, good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I am the mother of a 22-year-old neuroblastoma survivor. He was diagnosed back in 1999 um, with a very aggressive form of neuroblastoma that um, it basically was explained to me that statistics don't even apply to us, that the medical team was simply going to approach Josh, even if he only had a 1% chance to survive, as if he was that 1%. And he, they would continue fighting until that body proved to them otherwise. So with that introduction, we set forth on his cancer treatment. And um, there is a saying often soon after diagnosis that um, you don't have the luxury to worry about side effects. Side effects are something that you tackle later if your child survives. And so we simply focused on the treatment. We celebrated every little step along the way that we were able to go through. He started with six months of intensive chemotherapy in which he was neutropenic most of the time and had a lot of side effects with each of the chemotherapies that he received. Um, But we were very fortunate because he responded very well. So once that tumor shrunk enough, we were able to go through tumor resection, which went extremely well. We just were were very blessed with an incredible surgeon, and he recovered very quickly. So we moved on to an autologous bone marrow transplant, which was um, extremely intensive. Um, Josh responded very intensively with a lot of side effects, um, but we were able to get on the other side of that and had responded quite well. So a month after he completed the bone marrow transplant, he was designated as NED, no evidence of disease, which is the first huge milestone that anyone in childhood cancer treatment is reaching for. Um, They can't guarantee that um, relapse is not possible. With neuroblastoma, it's actually quite uh, vulnerable. However, for the moment, you get to celebrate that no one can identify cancer still in the body. And that is worth trumpets sounding and (laughs) bells ringing and lots of answered prayers and lots of gratitude around. And we did all of that. Um, But then the next part of the journey started and we had to worry about um, continued side effects. We had to worry about the possibility of relapse. And now fast forward from the year 2000 to 2021, we have seen what they mean by um, you worry about side effects later. Josh has encountered quite a number of side effects over the years. Um, A lot of it was immediate. We had digestive issues. We had learning challenges that were identified early. Um, He had um, a lot of digestive issues um, that required a number of different specialists that we had to go to. Um, His hearing loss was intense and um, quickly was diagnosed as moderate to severe. And um, chemo-induced hearing loss, if you're not that familiar, for such a young child, at this point he was um, still only two years old, um, impacts every area of your life and affects how you develop, how that young little brain is developing in those formative years. 
So that has um, initiated numerous challenges over the years, both in his personal life, in his academic life, and limitations in the workplace as he's matured into an adult. Um, puberty brought about a whole additional wave of challenge. What um, I was not aware of was that once those side effects had settled down, um, that was not the luxury that we would have for the remainder of Josh's life. It was a period of time where we had worked on side effects, found a way to work on them, and then with the onset of puberty, brought in a whole new wave of challenge. It exposed some areas that we did not realize that had been impacted to the degree that they were. Other areas like his hearing had gone from moderate to severe to profound quite quickly. We, he was diagnosed with chemo-induced ADHD. Some of the cognitive decline had gotten much worse. He was diagnosed with cardiomyopathy. He was diagnosed with auditory processing disorder and tinnitus, which are two additional components that, with the hearing loss, continue to challenge his ability to communicate with the outside world. And it seemed like every time we turned around, there was something else that was providing challenge. All of this on top of what a normal teenager is struggling with in trying to carve out independence, yet my son, without a whole lot of psychosocial support throughout these years, really was left grappling with a large amount of mature themes without any level of support whatsoever. He was spending a lot of time at home. Um, cluster migraines was a really big struggle for him. And uh, rather than being able to go to school every day, he was actually staying at home most of the time on home hospital care. So when he was 16, 17, 18 years old and he was watching friends, you know, um, planning, you know, trips after graduation, planning careers, you know, having college visits and applying to colleges, my son was pretty much living in his bedroom, half the time asleep, half of the time vomiting, most of the time struggling with um, hit these migraines. And one day specifically, he said to me, I don't have the luxury to even dream. I am struggling just to get through every single day. And I'm tired of most of my days being stuck in this bedroom with curtains drawn um, in his bed. And that's when it hit me extremely hard to what degree we were talking about of quality of life and how much these side effects were robbing him of the life that we had fought so hard for him to have. Um, and so as he graduated high school and, you know, we initially had him um, apply to college, started at the community college. Unfortunately, he wanted to go into a music education major at a very promising university about 30 minutes from our house. Um, every single audition that he had, uh, every audition appointment that he had set up, um, the migraines were so horrendous that we would have to cancel the audition. Um, the third audition he attended anyway, he said, mom, I have to try. And he vomited through most of it and he had to excuse himself before the end of the audition. And even the percussion coordinator reached out to me afterwards. And she said, that was probably the most heartbreaking attempt at an audition I've ever seen. And if he ever would like to apply again and audition, I will work with him personally on my own time to ready him for this audition because I can't imagine a student that's more deserving to enter this program. Um, and I just, uh, it just felt like a hug for a mom whose heart was breaking. Um, but what we decided was he would try the community college first. Turns out that that was probably the better route um, because he attempted twice in one semester to attend school. And the cognitive impact, the executive dysfunction that he was struggling with at the time was so extremely severe that he flunked out in a couple of weeks both times that he had attempted um, school. So we just decided that was not the route he was gonna go, that he needed to find a quality of life that made him um, proud, that gave him confidence, that gave him some joy. And then we would build a life around that. Um, so he was delivering pizzas, um, really concerned that he wasn't going to be able to live a life independently delivering pizzas. But at the time, it was a good place for him to start. 
But what he was able to do was devote time to music. And music is entertainment. Music is expression. Music is also extremely healing. And for my son, he received all of that. And the more confidence he was able to enjoy, um, coupled with at this particular point in time in the state of Maryland, the medical marijuana became available, which he applied and received immediately. And that was able to help us contain these cluster migraines that he was struggling with so much. So suddenly he had time where he actually was feeling good and he really could start to invest a part of himself into things that he cared about. And the music really did start to flourish. So um, I told him to follow that. Whatever was working well for him, that's what we wanted um, for him to spend his time. That's what we wanted to nourish so that he could develop a life that was worthy of him living after everything that he's been enduring all these years. And what's been very interesting is in the last year with the pandemic, um, he was no longer able to deliver the pizzas. He simply stayed in the basement, which has flourished into this incredible music studio. He has a 32 channel audio desk that he's mastering music recordings that he's doing himself. And, uh, a lot of his side effects have disappeared once the stress of everyday life had minimized during the pandemic. So for most of us, we were challenged by the limitations that the pandemic imposed on our life. For my son, simplifying his life to the degree that the pandemic did for him actually allowed him a chance to grow and flourish. And the side effects because they had minimized, had actually allowed him to continue to develop this music that he loves so much. But more importantly, I've watched his confidence grow. I've watched him settle. The executive dysfunction is starting to fall away. And he really is discovering how to manage a life that works for him. And so a few months ago, he uh, made the decision to apply to Social Security Disability so that hopefully once that's approved, um, God willing, um, this can be the life that he can sustain um, with a little bit of support from that Social Security Disability Benefits. And um, that's what we're hoping for because um, right now Josh has a life that's rewarding. He sets objectives for himself. He's accomplishing goals. All of those things that we dream for our children, all of those things that when we hold our babies in our arms that we want for them. And um, as a mother with someone going through childhood cancer, that's the type of life that we're dreaming for. And the side effects can really pose great challenge to that. Um, only in the last few months has Josh made comments like, um, he's proud of who he is. He's really happy with the life that he has. And that speaks volumes to this mom. And so I'm doing everything in my power for us to carve this out as the life that he gets to continue to live because he deserves it. Wow. Along the way, was he able to make friends and socialize like most kids or was that really off the table for him? That's a part of anyone's life. And I felt that that was a really important part of what he needed. We had families that we were friends with before he was diagnosed, even though he was diagnosed just before his second birthday. We had made some really close friends with other, I had, I needed that stimulation. We had little play groups for our babies. And those friends have still remained very close friendships for Josh. Um, but while he was in school, um, there have been ebbs and flows as to when he was in school, the activities that he was able to be involved in. He was involved in music and art in school. He did participate in some sports um, until he got a little bit older when things got a little bit more competitive. And so those are the friends that he has stayed in touch with. In fact, this band that he has created the co-leader of the band, if you will, is one of his best friends that he met with when he was in fifth grade. He doesn't have a huge amount of friends, but I am so extremely grateful that the friends that he does have are rock solid and they would do anything in the world for him. And, um, you know, they just, they when they're able to get together, um, 
it's, you know, it's for music, it's for fun. It's all of those wonderful things that we want for our kids when they grow up. How has this impacted your own um, career path? Now mine, little, <laughs> little, little bit of a different story. It's, it's tough for any mother um, when you have kids uh, making decisions about what is the higher priority, the career that I set out for or the time that I have available for my children. Um, throw in something like childhood cancer, and that really presents unique challenges, especially with such a vulnerable health as the type that my son had, because he was always sick or there was always a risk of him being sick, or there was always a response to something that was going on. Um, we had numerous doctor's appointments for a variety of issues. Um, he could get sick, uh, start out the morning, and in a few hours, I could get called from the school. So my career, before I had quit my job to have my children, I worked in the home office of an international insurance conglomerate in the corporate communications department. Um, I did a lot of event planning and I developed communication products. Uh, needless to say, that type of career was not something I was gonna be able to continue after Josh's treatment. Uh, what I needed instead was something that had flexibility. I needed something that would follow the school schedule so that when school was closed, I could be home with my children. Um, in addition to my son who's in, who is the one in cancer treatment, he had a younger brother, so I had two children to be concerned about. So instead, what I decided was um, I had initially worked for a music retailer that supported music programs in the school system that my kids belong to. And I eventually took a position for a nonprofit that focused on children's issues. And because children's issues was such a high priority, there was a great deal of respect for the people that worked at the organization and their own children's issues. And so I was really fortunate to find positions where my bosses and the organizations in its entirety really supported children's issues and gave me the flexibility with the respect knowing that if I needed to take a little bit of time because of a family emergency, that once that time, um, that time would be returned to once again focus on my work responsibilities and um, and it, it, my work ethic was quite high. And so um, it, it, I was able to find a balance that worked well for my family. For a lot of families um, with childhood or adult cancer, finances are a real issue. Um, dealing with insurance companies, making sure things are covered. Uh, what's your experience been like in that, re in, in that realm? Um, they actually, there's a term for that. It's actually called financial toxicity. And what I have learned in the first few years, I, I, there is a lot that is focused on this uh, Mount Everest of bills, if you will, especially when your children are going through things like a bone marrow transplant and some of these other things that a lot of these pediatric cancers demand. Um, and we dealt with quite a bit of that. Um, the problem is, is that as time goes on and when you're dealing with what I refer to as long-term survivorship, once you get beyond the five-year mark, you're dealing with eight-year survivorship, 10-year survivorship, 15 years of survivorship. If you have side effects that are continuing to plague you, you're constantly juggling money. I was a single mother. And not only were we dealing with medical issues, so I had the insurance challenges, I had the medical bills, but we had other issues. You're, you're challenged with an idea that your child may not survive. Um, we initially had a high relapse rate uh, for neuroblastoma that was a continual threat. And you do wonder, what if this is the last summer that I have with my family, especially if side effects are threatening? And um, so you're you're making different choices because most people who make um, financially driven decisions on how to manage their money, there is an expectation that you can wait 10 years for that incredible dream vacation that you want to take your kids to. You've got the 20 years that you can plan to get a house or, you know, whatever those um, goals are. When you have a child who's in newfound recovery for cancer, you're living month to month. 
you're living maybe at the most three years um, out from when you are planning because you don't have the luxury. You don't have the confidence that um, you can trust that your entire family will be intact beyond that. So you're making challenges in a much, or you're making decisions in a much different way. And I think some people on the outside might look at some of the decisions that a family in survivorship of childhood cancer might make and not think that it's the most financially sound. Um, But it was, some of those choices were the best for us. So it isn't just juggling medical bills. You're juggling car payments. You're juggling house payments. You're juggling going to the beach because maybe going to the beach is exactly what your family needs, even if it isn't um, the best thing that your bank account is is supporting at the moment. Um, But you make it happen. Um, The challenge is, is year after year after year, as you continue to live this way, there is a great deal of burden, an awful lot of stress, and a great deal of struggle as new side effects are discovered, new tests are required, um, your children are getting older, you start to develop a little bit more confidence, and then you, you do start to have to think about, what about college? What about my son, if he graduates high school, how will I continue to support him? So that's where we are now. My my survivor is 24 years old. We've been doing this now for 22 years. Um, My financial situation, I'm still striving for it to be what I would consider solid. Um, We've been very fortunate because um, we've never lost anything. I've never had a car repossessed. I've never... um, gotten into trouble with my mortgage. I've been able to keep most things above water, but the amount of stress, the amount of worry, and and I would even venture to call it PTSD, um, the amount of anguish that I go through when I'm managing my money and approaching certain bills and certain things that really generate a great deal of anxiety to me because of struggling to do it for so many years. And literally, you're just juggling money from one pot to another pot because something else has become more dire. Um, and that you can, anybody can do that short term. It's just that when your child exits treatment at the age of three, you think that you can figure out a way to establish financial solvency at some point. I was confident that I could do that. But here we are now, my son, now 24 years old, 22 years in survivorship, and we're still struggling. And so financial toxicity is something that I thought by now I would have been able to figure out a way to resolve, but we're just not quite there yet. You bring up an interesting um, concept, and that is PTSD for parents. PTSD is a complicated thing. I think people watch TV and they have a sense of what it is. Um, My understanding of it, without having memorized the criteria established by the DSM, is the re-experiencing, again, of an original event and and revisiting all of the anxiety, all of the fear, all of the emotion. Um, I think that there's a lot of families that have dealt with childhood cancer that will say that they have dealt with PTSD. I don't know if all of them would get diagnosed. I think there's a great deal of depression. I think there is a great deal of anxiety. I wish that the childhood cancer community would do a stronger job of teaching parents about that vulnerability right from the beginning, giving them screenings of being able to identify those vulnerabilities. Um, The PTSD that some families are experiencing is real. And I wish that any family, whether it's PTSD as a diagnosis or any of the symptoms that would contribute to that diagnosis would seek help. Um, In this community, we have more of an attitude of, you know, pull up your bootstraps and just suck it up kind of a thing, or they minimize it and say it's really not that bad. Um, With childhood cancer, there's a lot of fear and there's a lot of anxiety that's honorable. Um, and it doesn't go away just because you've been given a, um, a, the gift of NED or the classification of cured if relapse has not occurred in five years. Um, 
But parents deserve to heal. Parents deserve to have some assistance in working through all of that trauma, all of that um, depressive um, burden that they carry. Work managing the anxiety so that um, they get to live a, a, in a more healthy way because the threat of a relapse continues. As I said, these, these side effects and new diagnoses continue. The financial to toxicity continues. And as they say, if it is not healed, it is repeated. And I think without early intervention and support, it can continue to develop into PTSD, especially for some families that are really struggling with a lot of additional issues as the years go on. And I think for myself, when I refer to what possibly could be PTSD, again, it's that, that financial toxicity is something I've dealt with almost month to month. Um, you know, it would be interesting to see if I would actually meet the criteria to have it actually be a PTSD diagnosis. But nonetheless, I think what's important and that I recognize is it is an anxiety that I really, I really need to find um, some additional support myself uh, so that perhaps I can have a more healthy relationship and managing my money. And perhaps by doing so, maybe I can get to that solvency that I'm desiring so greatly. How do you find joy in all this? It's in the everyday. Um, this is this is this is nightmare creating stuff. These are the this is the type of existence most parents don't even have the ability to contemplate, um, and it, it it is heartbreaking, absolutely heartbreaking, and yet in the middle of every single day you can find the most beautiful moments with your family. You can find the most beautiful moments in humankind um, in living, in life. And I think without an attitude of gratitude, it really could end up um, doing the worst to, uh, to depress and overwhelm a person. But I know for myself, um, what I decided very early on was we were fighting to live and we were fighting for Josh to live for a good 80 years. And I just took on the attitude that if that's how we were wanting for him to live, then we were going to live that life every day. And so he has lived to the best of his ability every day of his life since he's gotten his diagnosis. And I've celebrated it right alongside of him. And I've just drank in for both of my sons, um, every beautiful thing um, that I have, the I have the gift, every blessing that I've received in all of these years, because um, that's what fuels me to keep going. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you found something in today's podcast that inspires you along your own life's path because sometimes a bump in the road is actually a portal into a more conscious and meaningful life. You can subscribe to our free podcast at www.bumpintheroad.us or become a premium member to hear the full conversation. Just go to www.bumpintheroad.us for more information and to sign up.